replay a lawyer's path to wealth with david baton episode 263 are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact with more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to a, another amazing guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. For those of you listening to this on the podcast, we're also broadcasting this live on Facebook. And we are, um, uh, so for our f- folks who are tuning in on Facebook, I just want to welcome you to this live broadcast where we have an amazing guest interview, David Baton. Um, and maybe I'm pronouncing his last name wrong because I forgot to double check in the green room. So uh, when I bring him on, we'll check and see if I got that right. Uh, but I'm really excited about having David here on the show uh, because David wrote a book called Secrets to Marketing and Automating Your Law Practice, which really is a compilation of a whole bunch of experts in a book um, talking about those uh, key things that you need to do uh, to really grow your firm uh, through marketing and automation. And that book was the the most recent book that was read in our um, our Reader's Nook uh, for, uh, for lawyers, which is a book club that we have. Uh, that book club is currently free to join. So if you haven't joined it before or you haven't you haven't joined it yet, you want to go, definitely go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash book club and join that Facebook group. Uh, we are going to be turning that into a paid product in 2021. So this is your last opportunity to join for free and it'll be free for you for the life of your membership. Uh, and in that group, uh, it's run by uh, my team member, who's also my daughter, uh, Mimi. And she um, gives the audience the, the ability to choose what book they're going to cover next through a poll. Uh, and they, they cover one book every two months. Uh, and it's really good. It's really exciting. And we're excited to have David here today because of the fact that we were reading that in the Reader's Nook. Now, the other reason that I'm excited to have him here today is because this idea that he's put together in this book of compiling other people is along, right along the lines of what we do with the Law Firm Growth Summit. Tickets are on sale right now for our February Law Firm Growth Summit. It's uh, February 9th to the 11th. It is a virtual conference, but if you've attended any virtual conferences this past year, you might be uh, a little bit dissatisfied with the experience you've had, and we are trying to change that. Uh, we're going to have a real physical stage that we're going to be broadcasting from, bringing that into your living room, your office, wherever you're joining from. And we really are making it interactive. We're going to have peer-to-peer networking. You're going to be able to connect with other people. Uh, you'll be able to talk to vendors live face-to-face. You'll be able to meet with speakers if you get the right ticket level that's going to get you there. So you definitely want to check this out, lawfirmgrowthsummit.com. We're going to have over 40 speakers and some really, really exciting stuff uh, like Kevin Harrington, uh, the initial sh- one of the original sharks on Shark Tank, Mike Michalowicz, the author of Profit First, Clockwork, Fix This Next, and a whole bunch of other books, uh, as well as David Nagel, who is a world-renowned uh, business coach, uh, and many, many other speakers. So go to lawfirmgrowthsummit.com right now, secure your ticket, uh, get 2021 started the right way by joining us there. Now let me introduce David to you. So uh, David is a five-time entrepreneur, best-selling author, legal CLE speaker, and previous co-founder and CEO of Practice Panther. You may have heard of Practice Panther. It is one of the leading uh, practice management software solutions on the market. Um, And I'm excited that we're talking with somebody who's one of the co-founders of Practice Panther. He's now working on a property management software for the real estate industry called Doorloop. He was a state champion tennis player who now spends his days with his wife and two children in Miami, Florida. I'm super excited about that too. As you all know, I'm a family man. Uh, I've got five kids and uh, love every single minute that I am able to spend with them. Uh, And I'm super excited to have David here. So without any delay, I'm going to bring David on the show. David, welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's my absolute pleasure. Now, David, I like to start at the beginning of a podcast episode uh, with introducing you to our audience. So if you don't mind just taking a moment, I gave you the official bio, 
but give us the background. Uh, how, you know, how'd you get started in, in the legal space and, and, and exit the legal space? And, um, and besides for hanging out with your, with your wife and kids, what keeps you busy these days? <laughs> so, uh, so it was a funny story getting into the legal industry. My partner and I partnered up in 2012 to start a CRM software called Pay Panther. And fast forward two years later, it didn't succeed, but we noticed that a lot of our customers were attorneys. And then at the time I ended up getting married to an attorney, my partner got married to an attorney, all of our friends started becoming attorneys, our clients were already attorneys, we said something's going on here. So uh, we looked at the competitive landscape and we thought we have a shot at this. So we jumped in head first into the legal industry and it obviously turned out to be great for us. Uh, and then getting out of the industry, you know, as you're growing and becoming one of the leaders in the in any industry, you're going to get approached by VCs, private equity firms trying to buy you. And when we felt the time was right and the right company came along, that's when we decided to uh, to make the transition and, and sell the company. Awesome. Um, so, uh, and that's a, a little bit delay there because I'm just messing around with trying to get. Yeah, this yeah, yeah live shared with <laughs> it wasn't working for my phone so i'm trying to do it on my uh on my on my desktop while i'm also recording this interview so um i shouldn't be doing that multitasking anyway uh awesome i love that story because the it's interesting the way i got started with attorneys uh is i wanted to help people create generational wealth as a matter of fact that's essentially what my mission statement is uh, my grandfather uh, came from Nazi Germany, ended up buying a, a, a piece of property on the west side of Manhattan, a, an apartment building there. Um, through that property, created significant wealth for, for himself, but he turned around and gave every single one of his 36 grandchildren the down payment for their first home purchase. And wow. being the, the recipient of that and seeing what kind of impact that had on my life, I wanted to create that for others. I wanted to give other people the opportunity to not only uh, create a better life for themselves, but to actually build wealth to the point where they can pass it along gener to generations uh, beyond them, uh, and also philanthropically do something with it in, in you know, in the world. So uh, I started a accounting practice uh, with the intention of helping business owners become super profitable uh, because they have the the unlimited potential of building of building that extra cash cushion, which can then be turned into uh, other wealth generating uh, activities besides for the business that they're in. Uh, th through that creation of that practice, I happened to get a, a law firm who then uh, wow. referred me to another, referred me to another. Before I knew it, I had five law firms as clients and those five law firms all had a common denominator. And that was, they were super successful they you know on the on the front of it right the beautiful offices uh, nice staff uh, clients coming through the door but behind the scenes they were literally moving personal funds every payroll cycle to make <laughs> payroll and yeah. you know that's um you don't get to see people's dirty laundry but that's not a good business model right it doesn't work and i realized that there's probably a lot of that if all five that i happen to get as my first clients are all doing the same thing there's probably a lot more that are doing that too. And you know, as a successful business person, that that's not healthy and that's not, you know, that's not going to get them to where they want to go. So we right. need to change that. We need to fix that. And hence my brand Profit With Law and the Law Firm Growth Summit were all started around this idea of helping lawyers. But I want to help a lot of people. Lawyers are not the only ones I want to help. It's just, it was a place to start, a place to get, uh, you know, to, to get this mission going. Um, so I'm excited for our conversation because I want to go there. I want to talk about wealth creation in general. But before that, you spent some uh, considerable time in, in the legal industry with Practice Panther and the, and the book you compiled. Um, in that experience, you've been exposed to a lot of law firms. If Looking yeah. from the outside in at these other businesses, where do you think law firm owners go wrong the most when it comes to achieving success in their mm -hmm. business? Wow. Where do they go wrong? So I can definitely tell you that a lot of the ones that I know personally and a lot of friends that I have that are lawyers, they don't spend enough time, energy, and money on advertising their business. And a lot of times lawyers get so busy and caught up with their day-to-day -day work that they are more focused in the business versus on the business. So a lot of law lawyers need to take a step back 
it's really hard when you have so much work to do. Look at the big picture, like you said, and analyze how can I make my business grow? Is it advertising, whatever it may be? So there's another great book, I'll have to think of the name, um, that talks a lot about, I think it's uh, The E-Myth, um, Michael Gerber, possibly. And it's, another thing is processes and procedures. So I know that I mentioned this in the book, I probably mentioned, you know, quoted that book also, but there's, there's a guy I know, his name is Brent Sibley, and probably one of the more successful attorneys that I know. And how he was able to grow was by creating what he called his Bible, which was his procedure book. Every single thing he did in a law firm, he wrote down and procedurized it. He created standard operating procedures. So it gave him the ability to take a step back from the law firm. He could take a vacation, work would still be getting done. He can hire people quickly and they can just read this procedure book and figure out how to do things. So procedurize your business, take a step back and spend more with marketing and advertising your law firm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely um, concur with those pieces. Uh, you know, uh, Michael Gerber in his book talks about the fact that there's a technician um, and then there's a business owner. And often we arrive at becoming the business owner from the technician perspective. Um, and the example he gives in his book is, is a lady who owns a bakery. Um, and essentially what happens is, is that the, the baker is constantly baking and she's not making use of the staff that she has. Um, and as Correct. as the lawyer who you know starts their practice and you know they feel like oh I need to be doing the legal services so I'm only going to try to fill the spots where I don't succeed where I I'm not you know I don't see myself doing all that work so I'm going to bring in a receptionist I'm going to bring in a paralegal what what they don't realize is is that hey if you're trying to build a business if you're trying to run something that's going to be a profitable entity for you uh, you might be better off sitting in that position of the business owner and letting somebody else bring another attorney in to do a lot of the legal work um, that you're right. doing. And, you know, like you said, with with spending money on marketing and things like that, you know, back 20, 30 years ago to start a business, you had to have some significant money in the bank to make that investment to start a business. We're in an unprecedented time right now where you need to you can start a business with with almost nothing you know a couple hundred bucks yeah. and you have a website and you you, you yeah. know and you don't even need business cards anymore you make a linkedin profile and make some phone calls and boom you're in business and the problem is is that because we feel like we can we can just uh you know as they say uh uh, uh put up a shingle um and you know and start start a practice uh we tend to forget the that investment is required um, and sure, you can use your sweat equity to build your marketing, but the reality is, is that so many law firms early on try to do it themselves. And what they do is, is they're significantly slowing down their progress because that's not the best use of your time. Right. For two, three thousand dollars, you could bring on a full fledged marketing agency to do that work for you. And maybe when you're more successful, you're going to spend more four or five thousand dollars. But if you think about it, that's a drop in the bucket. That's not even the cost of one single employee to do your marketing for you. And you've got a company that has multiple people who are going to be working on your account who know what they're doing. And you can just hand that off and continue to be the business owner and move on. So, um, you know, I think there's a ton of power in looking at those situations where, hey, how do I rather than do it myself? How do I hand this off to somebody else who can do it for me better, faster than I can do it myself? and really protect the use of my time to keep moving forward with operating this business. Right, I'll add one thing for that as well. So I have a friend that I was helping out, you know, grow his law firm uh, for fun. And uh, one of the things I kept telling him to focus on is sales. Hey, you're generating a lot of leads, great job. You're doing the marketing piece, right? You're doing Google ads, you're bringing leads to your website. They're signing up. They're filling out this questionnaire form. They wanna know more information, how you can help them but you're not closing them. You're not, they're not signing the contract. They're not paying you to deposit retainer. So I told him you really need to focus on sales. And I recommended him someone that I think very highly of that can really help him in sales. And the guy quoted him $5,000. And he said, no way I'm paying $5,000. And I said, it's nothing. If you close five clients, you're making it back. And this guy will easily help you close five clients and, and much more. And his conversion, I think at the time was, let's just say 10% of leads that came in. And I personally heard him on the phone and it was horrendous because he was talking like a lawyer, not like a human being, you know, using very big terms and, and jargon and 
I said, you know, an average consumer will have no idea what you're talking about. You're too confusing. So bring a sales guru in, he'll double your conversion rate and the $5,000 you'll cover in a month. And long story short, he ever, actually never ended up doing it. <laughs> and he still has a 10% conversion rate many months later. So yes, like you said, you have to invest in your business and, you know, business coaches, sales, you know, you spoke about, um, what's the, what's the name of the, uh, the law firm the growth summit. Program? Law firm growth summit, right. So I've been to many of those summits as a speaker, as a rep for, for practice Panther with a trade show, uh, booth. And there are so much good advice. You're going to get there. So many good people you're going to connect and network with. That's where you learn how to grow your law firm at summits like this. Yeah. And I, I love, I love this example that you gave because the reality is, is it, it's so true. Like we, when we approach sales from our own, you know, meaning of what, what somebody's looking for and we fail to see what, what really is bothering them. Uh, we tend to kill the deal before it even gets started. Uh, when somebody calls, they're not calling because they have a legal problem to solve. They're calling because they have a problem to solve. And you have to get familiar with what their problem is. You have to get to know them as a person so that you can relate to them. We had a guy, Jim Armstrong, on our podcast, and we'll link up the, the link to that in the show notes. And if, uh, if Mimi from my team is here, she'll put the, the link into the Facebook Live here. Um, but Jim Armstrong started a, a, uh, a company called Family of the Accused. And it was based off of, it's basically a support system for somebody who is a family member of somebody accused from a crime, of a crime, and you have to be there to support them. And in this episode, he describes what it was like to find, to seek a criminal attorney in another state for a family member um, that they needed to find a, defend, a defense for. And he, he articulates to the point where you get chills in your body listening to him talk about it, but he articulates what it was like to be in in that moment where they literally felt like somebody one of the, their family members lives were on the line and they had to find the person who was going to save that that you know save their life and the kinds of experiences they had and the person they ended up going with was not only good at what they did in the right attorney for the job but the experience they had in the office where they were treated with compassion and there was real empathy about their situation that was what made the decision for them. Um, and right. you have to be able to be in that mode. And if it's not you, then you're right. Bring on a salesperson. You know, I talk to people right. all the time who are like, no, I can't have a salesperson give legal advice. And, 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 I, and right. I said, exactly, that's the point, right? Yeah. In the sales conversation, yeah. you're not giving legal advice. You shouldn't be giving legal right. advice. That should come after they're a client. So, you know, that's, I love that example that you gave and I'm sorry that your friend didn't take your advice, you know, <laughs> he probably would be further along, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'll, I'll send you an email after with uh, some sales books that I recommended to him and other attorneys. And if you want, you can throw it in the show notes for later as well. Absolutely. Would love that. Um, so l let's talk about, there's, there's some people who are watching this that need, that need help in the marketing. They need help in the automation and that, you know, they should definitely go and read your book, which we'll link up in the show notes as well. Um, but what if somebody's killing it? They figured this all out. They're successful. They are now throwing off money uh, from their law firm and they're like, okay, what's next? Like, what is, do I, do I grow my practice? Do I, or what, or, or do I take this money and start to do something else with it? Um, you, you know, you're currently, I guess, uh, uh, creating this door loop thing. Um, so what is, uh, what are the different things you've been exposed to and where should somebody start looking to, um, you know, to put this into practice? Okay. So if you're tailing in on your law firm, you have excess cash, you don't know what to do with it. Great, great problem to have. There are probably a number of ways that you can go. Option one, you can just keep investing back in your business and keep growing your business if you want to. And sometimes you might reach a limit where you're saying, I don't know what else to do. And at that point in time, you could hire a consultant, an expert, a coach, join one of these groups, and they will help you grow the firm if you want to, if that's what you want. Uh, another option is you could sell the law firm and retire for the rest of your life. That's an option, depending how old you are. Another option is, it really depends on your passion. You know, for me personally, after I sold the company, I took a year off and then 
I got a little bit bored. I was approached by my previous business partner with another idea for a property management software. And this is our passion, right? I love software. I love marketing. So yeah, let's you know keep the mind working. Let's go. So that's what I did. Um, but there's so much you can do, right? You can invest money in your retirement for your children. Like you said, create generational wealth, create a will, create a trust. Um, you can do all of these sort of things. You can get into charity. Uh, you can do all these things that you always wanted to do, and now you have time and money to do. So that's a, it's a very general, broad answer, I know, but these are there's so many ways, there's so many things you can do. Yeah, and 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 I I love the fact that you've basically just outlined, hey, here's a, here's a whole list, right? Here's uh, here's a number of things that you can try, and you know, I I think the first place that that you need to look is, am I am I taking full advantage of of tax benefits that are available to me? Um, yes, I'm coming to it from an accounting background, uh, you know, and and yes, we have we we have an accounting firm here that serves lawyers. It's called Dream Builder Financial. Uh, if you want to know more about it, you can just post a comment on this Facebook Live, and we'll get back to you. But um, the reason I say that, and and you can piggyback on and let me know your thoughts on it. Um, but lawyers are in this unique category. Accountants are in there too, where you know there's a significant drop off of a you know tax protection that you get once your income exceeds collective. You're 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 with you you and your spouse, so your combined income exceeds a certain threshold. Uh, in the three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar range, um, and then beyond that, you're also looking at uh, you know increased uh, taxes on uh, any money that you make that's 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 uh, that's through these passive income types. So you suddenly become uh, you know uh, responsible to pay an extra three point eight percent on that, and then your income tax level goes up. So the more money you make, yes, I mean people who are not at that level are going to be rolling their eyes and saying, yeah, I wish I had that problem. But the reality is, is you can easily between state taxes, income taxes, and the uh, the 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 excess uh, uh, income on on passive income tax, uh, you can easily be paying well over fifty percent on money that you're making, which really slows down the wealth creation that you're that you're working on creating. So I think that once you you really are are bringing home a significant am amount of money from the law firm, the first place to go is to make sure that you're doing your darndest to uh, be as smart as possible when it comes to your, your tax positioning. And that also can help drive your investments. There are certain investments that are going to be pr tax protectors for you. Um, you know, real estate can do that if done right. Uh, so you need to look at, when you look at your investments, you need to look at tax along with it. So it's kind of like, you know, you really start to need to get educated in um, in this world, because if you think about it, it's, it's your biggest expense more than any other expense in yeah. your business is your tax. Yeah. Yeah. And I personally had to learn the hard way many times, um, <laughs> where, where now that I know how much money I could save, had I known certain tax laws and rules, you know, for example, you can put a part of your law firm or investments, real estate brokerage account in irrevocable trusts that are protected from predators that get passed on to your, you know, your kin for future generations that are, you know, there, there's so many things, you know, if you're, if you're really in the high net worth range, you have to start thinking about the lifetime gift tax exemption. When you die, how much can go to your spouse tax free? How much can go to your children tax free? I think now it's 23 million for both of you, but that will obviously change over the number of years. Then there's uh, how much you can give to your children. There's asset protection you have to worry about. So it's not, uh, you know, so simple. Definitely consult with an accountant and probably an asset protection attorney and an estate planning attorney. There, there's so many people you need to have in your in your life that can help you with all these things. Yeah, and that goes back to your conversation earlier with Michael Gerber's book and you know being willing to spend on marketing um, is that you need to recognize when you need these team players on your team, right? You need to you need to know. Okay, I've arrived at this point, and now. I need to I need to engage somebody and maybe you just engage them for an initial conversation to find out whether you need them or not. Um, but you, yeah. you, you got to educate yourself uh, when it comes to this stuff. So tax is one is one thing. Um, now, with with what you're doing with with door loop, does that open your eyes to the possibilities in, in real estate? I think real estate investing is like the, the best 
a lot of people are leery of the stock market. You know, they they hear about, oh, yeah, the market's booming, but they also hear about, oh, my gosh, the market crashed. Real estate just feels like a, a safer place to put your money where you don't have that kind of volatility. But at the same time, depending on how much hands on you want to have, uh, you know, you can you, you can go and buy some some, you know, one to four uh, unit uh, single family homes um, and rent them out, or you can you know, park your money with it with a company that's investing in, in massive, you know, apartment buildings or commercial properties. Um, so, what's your what's your experience been there? Have you gotten involved in any of those? And, and where do you think somebody might want to start when they're first getting their feet wet? All right, so I could talk about this topic for hours because uh, I've been heavily into this for the last few years. So, just just a quick note on stocks. A lot of people will warn you against the risk of stocks and tell you it's dangerous. I lost money. My family lost money. I know someone who lost their life savings. All you have to do is ask two very simple questions. Number one, the person that lost money, did they invest in an individual stock? They chose their own companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, whatever it was. Or did they invest in an ETF with hundreds of companies? For example, the S&P 500, where you buy one stock or an ETF but you're really diversified. You own a portion of 500 companies. So if one of the 500 goes bankrupt, you don't lose really anything. So that's the first question. Second question, when the market tanked, which we saw in 2000, 2007, and 2020, did they panic and sell? And what you'll realize if you go back in time is if you were diversified in an ETF, let's say in 08 or 2020, and the market crashed, and you just held on, for a year, or in this case, for like four months, you would have done great. You wouldn't have lost anything. You probably would have even made money. So that's the only two questions you have to ask people about stocks. So stocks really is not that dangerous if you're doing it smart, if you're level-headed, and if you're not level-headed and you are an emotional investor, then hire a financial advisor. They'll take 1% and they'll do it for you. Um, so that's on stocks. And you can have my favorite website that I signed my whole family up is called betterment.com. They do it all for you. They can automatically invest in safe ETFs for you. It's very safe. You can do an IRA through there as well. Um, so that's a little bit on stocks. Now, real estate investing, you have two broad options. You could be an active investor or a passive investor. I personally am not an active investor because it's active. It takes a lot more work, a lot more energy, a lot more time, a lot more expertise. Like you said, as an active investor, you are buying your own properties, your single family home, you're furnishing it, maybe you're renovating it, you're renting it out, you're the property manager now, you're collecting rent, you're sending eviction notices, you're sending repairmen, maintenance. So I just don't have the head, time and energy for that. So I personally don't do that. But yes, as an active real estate investor, you will make the most money. Okay, it has the highest returns normally. And a lot of people like that because they can feel and touch their investment. They can see it. It's physical. So a lot of people love that. Now, I'm a digital software guy, so I don't care to feel and touch it so much. So I'm the passive investor. And passive, you have a lot of options. Option one, which I personally do, you can invest in something called a REIT. Just like investing in a stock, it's the exact same thing. You can, instead of buying the S&P 500, you buy something called VNQ, a Vanguard REIT which is just like the S&P, but for real estate, you are investing in tens of thousands of properties across the US in all this different asset classes from industrial, retail, commercial, everything. So that's what I do. What you can also do is invest in a fund, like as a limited partner. If someone comes to you and says, I have this great investment, we're putting together a group of investors, we need $5 million, we're buying a shopping center, and you're a limited partner, Give me fifty thousand dollars. You'll be a one percent partner, whatever it is. So that's another option. And with that option, generally you will make higher returns with a higher risk. Okay, I can talk about that. And lastly, you can do something called crowdfunding, which I also do. And there's a great, there's a few websites, but the one that I chose was called Fundrise.com, and you can get started, I think, with a hundred dollars. And you just invest the money, and they invest in real estate for you. So um, I don't know how deep you want to go into this conversation because I could literally talk for hours about this. No, I think that this is I think is a good real real good overview. And you know, honestly, I, I, when it comes to investing, you know, if you're risk averse, if you're you know, then how did you become a law firm owner in the first place, right? 
Right. Um, that is the riskiest move you could have made in your entire life was leaving yeah. a secure job with a paycheck and starting a law firm where your future is in your hands. Now, at the same time, your future is in your hands. And that's really why most people start it is because, hey, I, I, I think I can do better long term with paving my own way than relying on somebody else and following their structure to hopefully make partner one day and, and eventually be you know, be making the big bucks. And yeah. uh, most lawyers take a pay cut when they start their law firm. And many of you are still in the pay cut um, from starting your law firm because you might be at a four person at, at law firm or a four attorney firm and still not be making more than you made at a paying job. Um, right. And, you know, so so you need to look at what you've been willing to do with your with your day job, with your with your career and say, OK, I actually am willing to take on risk. Now let me look at, okay, what is the potential return of all of these different options I have available and, and what, and how, how much, how risky is it really? Um, you know, the, the stock market is actually not a very risky investment if you're willing to hold it long term. Like you said, David, you know, did they, did they get out at, you know, people tend to buy high and sell low, right? That's how they get right. burned in the stock market. But historically, the market has returned at on average somewhere, but somewhere between 10 and 12%, depending on who you're asking. So, uh, you know, that's a decent return on, on your cash compared to parking it in a savings account that's going to pay you, if you're lucky, a quarter of 1%. So, uh, you know, the stock market is a great place. And then if, depending on how active you want to be, you do, just like you said, with active real estate, you can also be active in, in stock market. You can be a trader. Yep. You can be yep. an options trader you, or you can be an investor and invest passively long term where you just kind of like set your allocation. And I'm going to put, you know, 50 percent in US, U.S. stocks and 30 percent internationally and 10 percent in emerging markets and you put it in this in these ETFs that that diversify it over a basket of companies. Um, That's and, pretty much literally my portfolio, by the way, what you just mentioned, which is the 401k and IRA portfolio of most Americans. Right, exactly. Especially if you use the target date retirement funds that they make so easy for you. It's like one click yeah. and I'm done. The problem yeah. is, is that those funds are all based off of historical allocations. And if you look at it, you have a significant allocation to bonds depending on what age you are. But even at 25 years old, they're putting 30% of it in bonds or something like that. Bonds is, yeah. is going to be the worst investment possible. We're at, we're at the lowest yeah. interest rate. If you understand how bonds work, it's the inverse of the interest rate. So when interests go up, the value of your bond pro portfolio goes down. So we're at the lowest interest rate level possible. It cannot go further than here which means that there's no way to make money. There's only ways to lose money in the bond market. Now, bond gurus will argue and say, yes, there is. If you go with higher risk debt, lower risk debt, shorter term maturities, longer term maturities. I don't want to go into that. Like That's not the point of, of our discussion. But sometimes taking the easy way out and not understanding what you're investing in can also not be the best thing for you. So I think it's like anything else, you really need to get educated and understand at least the basics of, hey, where's my money going? Where am I putting it? Um, but you mentioned retirement accounts. That's another big one. Like you own a business. You have a massive opportunity to protect, you know, upwards of, I mean, you, you can, if you do a deferred, compens a deferred compensation plan, um, uh, a, a, a um, uh, not deferred compensation, a, um, a defined benefit um, pension plan, you can put a quarter of a million dollars pre-tax into that um, and, you know, and, and save that for, for retirement. So depending on your goals and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of capability that you have as a business owner to protect a lot of your income from taxes. Uh, and if you put money into a 401k, a solo 401k or a four, traditional 401k or an IRA, uh, SEP, simple, you can put that into a self-directed IRA and you can still invest that in real estate or other things outside of the stock market if you choose to do so. So depending on your appetite for risk and what you're willing to do, there's a lot of different places that you can go when it comes to um, what do I do with this money, uh, you know, once I'm generating it. Right. And, I, and I'm laughing inside because you're throwing out so many terms that I'm assuming not everyone knows. SEP, simple, this, that. I know everything you're talking about because I researched it, but I had a year off to research it. I had all the time in the world 
to read every single book you can imagine on stock market, investing, asset allocation, every article, every YouTube video, spoke with numerous financial advisors. So I understand what you're saying, but I would recommend majority of people just speak to an expert, financial advisor, accountant, because there is so much information to know. And I did a lot of it myself and I messed up a lot. I really messed up a lot. I triggered capital gains taxes. I did tax loss harvesting the wrong way. I made big mistakes that cost me a lot of money with because I did not consult with the experts out there. So I'm paying for it now, but now that you learn, you live and learn, right? So please learn from my mistakes and speak to an expert. Right. And I think that this, you know, this idea of talking to an expert, getting help, you got to vet the expert. You got to find the right person. You got to find the person who you mesh with yeah. personally and who has the level of expertise that you need. Now, not everybody needs a high level of expertise, depending on where you are in your journey. So you got to know where where am I? What level of expertise do I need? And honestly, like when you evaluate anything that you're going to that you're going to buy any long term relationship you're going to have with a service provider, you have to do your due diligence. You're not going to yeah. go and, and hire a marketing agency. Well, most people, many people do this, right? I'm going to hire a marketing agency for five thousand dollars a month, but I'm not going to talk to any of their clients before I do that to make sure that they're happy and they're actually getting results. Right. Right. If you when you think about it, when you hear me say it, it sounds ridiculous. But 90% of, of the consumers out there are making buying decisions based on their own gut, their experience with the, with the salesman they were talking to. If you would just take it a few steps further and check out their reviews and talk to past clients, ask them to give you a dissatisfied customer. Most vendors won't do that, but see, you see what you can get. You know, maybe you can find out why somebody was dissatisfied, why they were unhappy because you don't want to be the next dissatisfied customer. You want to be successful. Um, and it goes, you know, it goes in, in the, 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 the practice of your business and it goes in the rest of your, your wealth journey. There's always going to be professionals you need along the way. I mean, you're an attorney. How are people deciding whether to use you? Yes, you can hire that salesman that we talked about and he can do a great job selling. But if you're not doing a great job servicing your customers, ultimately that's going to come back and that's going to hurt you because People are going to hear about that. They're going to know about that. Um, so you got to have good people to saying good things about you. And the same thing is when you're seeking the services, you got to find the people who are saying good things about them and ask the right questions so you know you're choosing the provider that's right for you. And just to touch on two things that you mentioned there. So on the reviews, so I think we do mention it a lot in the book because I'm a huge proponent of reviews. You know, Email-based, text-based reviews on your website are one thing, but a video testimonial speaks thousands of more words. It is night and day the best investment you can make to take a professional video testimonial of your client or just tell them to on their iPhone or Android, hey, just send me a quick video testimonial. Or if they're in your office and you just hand them a big check, you do personal injury, and they're so happy, take a video testimonial right there and then if you can. So that's amazing if you can get that. Uh, one other thing you mentioned, if you're gonna hire a marketing agency. So I recommend to a lot of friends, one or two marketing agencies, but every time I recommend them, I say before you hire them, you need to read this book on Google Ads so you understand what they're doing for you and you can be knowledgeable and ask the right questions and make sure they're doing the right thing. And you know your business better than they're ever gonna know your business, so you'll have ideas and you'll share with them. And the book that I always recommend is by Perry Marshall, on Amazon. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Google Ads. It's about a 500 page textbook. I read it in one night. It was that good. Well, for me at least. Um, but it really educates you. So whatever you're going to do, if you're going to hire any expert, read, learn, study, and ask good questions when you're when you're talking about it. Yeah, I love that you read a 500 page book in one night. That's, you know, yeah. folks, yeah. pay attention, right? This is successful people. <laughs> you know, they, they choose a book, they realize they need to read it and they just consume it and 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 and, and then move on from there and take action, right? Um, I, I think that's the biggest thing that we don't talk about is action takers are the ones who succeed. There's so many people yeah. who sit in the unknown and they're like fearful of taking the next step. What if, what if that we, we don't move and, and, and take that action. And without doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute 100% failure, right? You're guaranteed to fail if you don't take the next step. Um, and I think that that's, you know, 
that you have friends who ask you for advice and you give it to them. But the question is, are they actually doing something with it? Right. How many of them are reading the book before they're bringing on that that marketing company that you're recommending? Um, and, you know, and, and your friend who you, you, you propose this uh, this sales closer to uh, or the salesman to the sales company, uh, you know, that you get what you pay for. But if you're not paying for it then you certainly get what you pay for, right? You pay zero yeah. and you get nothing. You're going to get, you're going to end up with nothing for, to show for it. Um, yeah. So it goes back to that, that conversation of needing to invest in your business, but needing to be, to be smart about it. Right. And then one, one quick word on, you know, fear. So I've noticed that a lot of people in general, not only just attorneys, they have this fear and these assumptions in their head that, oh, I can't do this because this will happen. I, I can't do Facebook ads because the Florida bar has to get me to, they have to approve every single Facebook ad and I can get disbarred. First of all, you probably won't get disbarred for putting up the wrong Facebook ad. Majority of attorneys don't even approve it by the Florida bar. It is the right way to go. And if you are that scared, I'm just proof by the Florida bar. So they have a lot of assumptions in their head that holds them back from growing their business. So please try not to make those assumptions and get those fears out of the way if you kind of move forward. It's like you said, it's all about executing and executing fast. Do it as quickly as you can move fast. Yeah, I'm, I'm chuckling because first of all, I, you know, I've got coaching clients and I see it in my own clients. I know which ones are going to succeed and which ones are going to struggle because I can yeah. see the speed of their execution. Yeah. But I'm also yeah. chuckling because I did a whole podcast episode. Um, I don't know if we titled it on fear, but uh, exact, the exact example that you gave is the one that I use, which is, you know, people are afraid <laughs> to do something because the bar yeah. doesn't allow it. And the funny thing is, is that you haven't done, you haven't looked personally and checked to see if you're allowed right. to do it or not. You heard right. a colleague tell you over coffee at a networking event that, you no, no, we can't do this kind of advertising. And the reality is, is that when you go and read what you are and aren't allowed to do, you're suddenly gonna be like, oh yeah, I actually could do it as long as I put this disclaimer, or I actually could do it as long as I'm not right. directly promoting this service. So 90% of your Facebook marketing is gonna be informational. You can put information out there all you want. You're not even, it's not like you're doing a TV commercial where you're directly saying, hey, I'm going to get you a million, a million dollars for your personal injury lawsuit. You're not doing that. You're, you're putting out a video that says, hey, know your rights when you get into an accident. You have, you know, X, Y, and Z. That's allowed in every bar in every state all across the U.S., so it's, you know, it, it really get to know what your restrictions are before you hide behind them, um, you know, is, is part of that. But I think it's ultimately, you know, people are, if I have something to put, hang my hat on and say, this is why I'm not taking the next step, that's the easier route than taking the next step. And success is uncomfortable. It's the result of discomfort. And we have to get out of that comfort zone. We have to be willing to go take the next step if we want to be successful. Uh, and I think that if we go and, and have conversations with a hundred successful people, that'll be weaved into, you know, the question of, Hey, what do you think it takes to be successful for probably 90% of them? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, this is a little bit off topic kind of, but a lot of people think that you have to work like crazy day and night, 24 hours to be super successful, put in the hours. Yeah, sure. More hours does help but it's not everything. You know, I, my time is much more limited today with two kids than it was 10 years ago when I was not married, no kids, no anything. And what I can tell you is in my previous companies, 80% of the things I did were a waste of time. All the results, 80% of the results came from 20% of the actions we took. So focus on a few small things that bring in most of the results and ignore the rest of the noise. There's so much noise out there. So set your priorities, set good habits. When you work, work. Turn your phone off, turn your social media off, get things done, work off a list. Like I still do today, even a pen and paper list, even though there's technology out there, whatever works for you. And then just make sure you're focusing on the most important thing today. Yeah, I love that you went there because um, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I uh, one, my coach recently did, um, he did a whole segment on, on time. And how you create time. Um, I think it's um, uh, Gay Hendricks and the Big Leap that talks about this concept of Einstein time, where basically it, you know, you create time. And if we look at our lives, we can we can see proof throughout our lives of it. 
you always make time for what's the most important for you. And yeah. what happens is, is that we, sh we show up at work and we, we arrive at entrepreneurship from the employee mindset. I'm going to clock in at nine, leave at five. I have to be here for eight hours. So while I'm here, I might go get lost on Facebook or I might do this or that and the other. The reality is, is that there's nobody, you don't have a boss. You're your own boss. You can decide I'm only going to work four hours a day. You can decide I'm not going to set my hours. I'm just going to set my four hour work. What I want to finish today, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, what was it? Was it Tim Ferriss's four hour work? Tim right? Ferriss. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the whole concept there with in his book is, hey, you know, I was working for somebody as a full time employee, and I hired a bunch of people in the Philippines to do my work, and just didn't, you know, didn't tell them about it. Um, but the reality is, is that you can do that. Right. And, and one of the things that we've found this year is, holy cow, we don't need people in the office and we still function. Right. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like, wait, I can yeah. hire somebody in Colombia. I can hire somebody in Mexico. I can hire somebody in the Philippines and get a lot of the work done. And they are a fraction of the price. And I save a ton on taxes. Um, so you got to think outside the box, but you have to take away this relationship with time that we have is something that needs to be broken. And you need to recognize that my success is not going to be directly correlated to the amount of effort that I put in, in the amount of effort I put in, in relation to, as it relates to time. Um, and as a matter of fact, your number one goal should be, how do I achieve the same level of success with half the amount of time I'm putting in now, or with a quarter of the amount of time that I'm putting in now. And if you can achieve that, then you've won the game because everyone else is doing the work and you're just reaping the benefits. And that's what a business owner is. So uh, love, so love I'll, that you I'll talk there. about time for a second because um, this is so funny that there's, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it's called Parkinson's Law. Have you heard of this? Absolutely. Well, my entire, okay. like, so Profit First is really where I started as, as you know, as an accountant. Is, whoa, where, where am I here? Yeah. Um, and Mike Michalowicz's idea of Profit First is based off of Parkinson's Law. So Parkinson's right. Law dictates um, that given a finite resource, uh, our consumption of that resource is going to expand to the amount of that resource available to us. Go ahead. What's right. Parkinson's right. Law? So, so basically, work... <laughs> your work expands to fill the time allotted. So exactly. if I have to get this draft or brief done and I have a week to do it, I will take my full week and it will take me 12 hours. But if I have two hours to do it and I have a deadline right now at 6 p.m. in two hours, somehow miraculously, I'll get it done. It, you know, and, that, and that's the truth, that's what happens. So it's so funny because if you ever realize, let's say you're going on vacation the next day, you have so much work to get done by tomorrow, by Friday, somehow you're the most productive person in the world. It's like you took the pill from Limitless and you got everything done in 24 hours. You're like, how did I do that? It's amazing. Or you're on a plane, there's no Wi-Fi, and you crank out. Like I wrote all my books that I've ever written, I've written on a plane. Or I only had a three or four hour flight, or my honeymoon to Thailand was a 12 hour flight, and I got done work that would have taken me months. Because you don't have a lot of time, you're you're not you're not distracted, and you get it done. Um, and the reverse is true, right? So when I had a lot of time in my life, and I had to go buy something or do something, it just took me forever because you know it didn't really matter. So set hard deadlines in yourself, and get things done as quickly as possible because you really could do I'm, it. I'm sure your wife appreciated spending 12 hours next to you while you wrote a book. On your honeymoon. <laughs> there was a TV. There was a TV. It was it was on the way back actually. There was a TV, so we were going. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the one takeaway I got is 12 hours on the way to our honeymoon. I was writing a book. On the way uh, back, yeah. Great. Well, folks, this was, it was a great conversation. We kind of went all over the place, which was exactly what I wanted to do here talking to David. And um, if, you know, if you enjoyed any of this, uh, if you're watching it on Facebook live, make sure that you are following the profit with law page. Uh, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you get notified every time we go live. Now, there's going to be something that we're doing here that we uh, don't normally do. And that because we recently read David's book, David has agreed to uh, come on a Zoom call and do a live Q&A with members of our book club. Uh, so if you want to get on that Q&A, we're going to close down this, this live broadcast and we're going to go into the Facebook group. Um, in the Facebook group, there is a, uh, a Zoom link and we're going to do a, a Zoom call uh, and answer questions that you have. Uh, you can come and, and talk to David directly. 
Uh, so if you're not a member of the book club, you want to go right now to profitwithlaw.com forward slash book club, profitwithlaw.com forward slash book club, request to, to be to join there. Um, and Mimi will allow you in um, and, um, and, and tag you on that post so that you can come and join uh, the Zoom broadcast that we're going to resume our conversation there uh, as soon as we end this recording. The last thing I want to do is just remind you that we have our Law Firm Growth Summit coming up February 9th to the 11th. Um, tickets are on sale right now. It's a virtual event, but it is going to be different than any virtual event you've attended. I guarantee you this will be a much better experience than you have had so far with virtual conferences. Listen, in 2019, I ran a virtual summit for law firm owners. We had 2,300 attendees, 31 speakers, and this was before COVID. We know how to put on an event for you. We've learned from our mistakes the last time, and we are going to make it even better. As a matter of fact, we're doing a major grand prize giveaway. Um, we've already announced that we're giving away a Peloton. There is going to be far better, far greater prizes than that. Uh, that we're going to announce over the next few weeks. And the ticket prices go up every Monday. So you want to grab your tickets right now while the price is where it's at because it is going up. Uh, go to lawfirmgrowthsummit.com. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. And uh, we're here on the podcast every two, uh, twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. This is a Wednesday, but that's um, the live broadcast. This will be released on the podcast tomorrow on Thursday. Uh, and we'll be back again uh, the following Tuesday. This will also be the last episode for 20. 20. Um, wow. So have a very, very happy new year. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all and seeing you all crush it in 2021. David, thank you so much for being here. And I'll catch you on the Zoom call in just a moment. Sound good. Thank you for having me. Take care. Take care. Have you been enjoying the show? We sure hope so. To make sure you never miss an episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app. Next week, we will be back with more valuable resources and ideas on how to break the mold and take your law firm to the next level.